Welcome back to the Clean Sailors podcast. Let's talk about sea, marine, sailing, and keeping it clean. I'm your host, Holly, founder of Clean Sailors, and a sailor myself with a passion for the health of our mighty oceans. Through conversations with experts, innovators, and activists, all working towards improving the health of our seas, we're showcasing the people and projects changing the way things are done. So in 2023, with the Ocean Conservation Trust and Savvy Navi, we launched a global campaign called Protect Our Beds to help stop vital seagrass being destroyed. I'm really excited today to be joined by various members of the project, Mark Parry from the Ocean Conservation Trust, David Cusworth from Savvy Navi, and also Vicky Spooner from Falmouth Harbour, who played an instrumental part in working with AMS Moorings and protecting seagrass. Hello all, thank you for joining me. Hello. Good morning, Holly. It's nice to be here. Good morning. Good to see you all. So let's talk about seagrass. Mark, just explain your background and why seagrass is important. So my name's Mark Parry. I work for the Ocean Conservation Trust and I am the head of ocean habitat restoration. And I think that role exists because many of our coastal habitats are sadly under pressure and need to recover. So the Ocean Conservation Trust has dedicated much of its funds and its time to understanding why these habitats are declining and under pressure and try to create concrete sort of actions to be able to set the process in reverse. So for the last 10 years, we've had a a focus on seagrasses. The primary reason that we were interested in them is because we also run the country's largest aquarium and we were very interested in the types of fish and the seasonal changes that our seagrass meadows around the UK experience through seasons because fish are mobile and we get different fish visiting at different times of the year and what we wanted to understand was why our vital seagrass beds around the UK or what services that they were providing to coastal communities and and certainly as a group of biologists and people that run an aquarium just sort of interested in the species that we find on them and what did you find in a nutshell we found that when the seagrass meadow is healthier so the plants are a higher density and those plants in the meadow are doing really well and they're growing big and strong, then they effectively support more biodiversity and more life. So we looked at various different sort of taxa of marine species, so things that do move and things that don't move. The general takeaway message was that if we have really healthy seagrass beds, we have lots of different diversity on them. And if we have non-healthy seagrass beds, then we don't have a great deal of life or or biodiversity associated with them. It was a three-year heritage lottery funded project and we used, we asked citizen scientists to get involved in gathering the data. So we asked divers, sailors and kayakers to contribute towards all the data collection. Healthy seagrass means more biodiversity and more fish. And seagrass meadows, as we know, and this has sort of come to light predominantly in the last couple of years on a real sort of public scale, particularly for the last five years or so. And we now understand or more publicly understand that they store about 10% of the ocean's carbon as well. So whilst we've got obviously the diversity of fish species, which obviously supports the global food chain really in our waters, they're also quite big protagonists of climate change, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think from our perspective at the beginning, we were very interested in animals and particularly some of the protected species and rare species that we find on the seagrass meadows. And as we travelled through this process and learned more and started working with different partners, then this conversation about the other services that seagrass provide did start contributing towards the conversation. So you talk about carbon and there's quite a worldwide interest, I think, in protecting and restoring seagrass meadows for uh, abatement and sequestration of carbon. So they are quite big carbon sinks. If you think about restoring seagrasses, you could take a area of barren sand. There are things living in that sand, but not as much as if there's a seagrass meadow there. And restoring that seagrass meadow, you recover the biodiversity. And it also starts then locking away more carbon. 
And that's interesting in the marine environment because once it's stored in the sediments, then it's out of the carbon cycle. So in our terrestrial ecosystems, then our plants all around us store carbon and that cycles through the year when we look out of the window or, or walk through the through the woods in the northern hemisphere in the summer there's lots of leaf matter and that's obviously carbon but during the autumn that falls to the ground that rots and then sort of recycles back into the atmosphere whereas what we refer to as blue carbon and the habitats that do the heavy lifting in the ocean environment would be mangroves salt marshes and our sea grasses what they do is they take that carbon put it into the sand and there isn't that cycling that seasonal cycling and there isn't sort of rotting or actually in the absence of fire as well it's not easy for this carbon to be mineralized back into the atmosphere so seagrasses and, and blue carbon in general is something that is of interest to many around the planet um, to contribute. And it isn't sort of panacea for global warming or carbon sequestration, but it's an important thing to add to the mix when we consider all of the other values that seagrass provide worldwide, then it is a really, really valuable and important habitat to protect. I think you mentioned obviously the locking in the carbon, but just in a current context, and appreciate Vicky and I are very close geographically where we're speaking from. And we've, you know, seen even in the last couple of days, given the strength of the storms that have been battering our coastline, that, you know, part of my favorite beach has been washed away, as an example. And, you know, there's the locking in carbon, but there's also the element of locking together the actual seabed, right? Vicky. Tell us a little bit about the actual root structure of the seagrass and how that too helps support coastlines. So the seagrass have rhizomes, which cause a horizontal map, which is sort of very intricate and it holds onto the sand. So when, they, when you get these extreme weather events, hopefully it will provide a service to us of grabbing hold of that sand and, and keeping it where it is rather than allowing it to move around so much as we've seen recently in the northwesterly storms we've just had through. I think it's a really important topic and that it's, I mean, it goes the same on land, right? You get sort of that overland flow extenuated by the fact that we've been taking down trees and we've been tarmacking gardens and obviously got a lot of car parks and otherwise, and actually making sure that obviously we've got that root structure within the shallows in particular, which are obviously along coastlines to hold it all together is, is in particularly important. But going back to you, Mark, obviously we talked about how important seagrass is, but I understand that obviously, you know, the importance of seagrass in the UK alone, we've lost nearly half of our seagrass beds, I understand, since 1930s, mainly due to arguably avoidable human activity. How are we impacting or how is seagrass getting damaged by human interaction? Yeah, so it's interesting that you raised the 1930s because there was a, a sort of major event. And one of the things we've got to consider is there wasn't really the technology to map our coast lines in the 1930s and people weren't able to go scuba diving so they weren't really able to explore this underwater world so there are sort of historical events that show that there was a large dieback in the 1930s of zostra marina the predominant species that we have in the uk which is a subtitle species Again, we weren't able to acoustically map areas or, or send cameras down or, or even witness it with our own eyes. You've got to realise that the mapping methods are only a recent sort of advent, really. And we've evidence that we've lost at least 50% since the 1940s. But there are estimates that habitat suitability for seagrasses is much wider so it's quite a conservative estimate. What's contributed towards it is one, there's been a pathogen that's passed through the plant and uh, that's spread reasonably quickly um, through the early 1930s. And what has remained, a lot of people don't know where it is or its significance. Some of the conversations that we've had at the Ocean Conservation Trust are that it's a seaweed and, and people don't necessarily like green things that live on the bottom of the sea. 
they probably prefer to go off the beach swimming in in nice sort of sandy white lagoons but I think the point is that people have not necessarily understood what it is, not understood its significance, and not also understood where it is. So if there's, for example, some activity that's taking place on the coastline, and you mentioned this point of sediment stabilisation, so that's a way that seagrass impacts the community that lives on the coastline. It, It sort of protects them from some of the harmful actions of the waves and those big storm events. But we also have an effect on seagrasses as well. So some of the activities that take place on the beach, so there might be development, there might be agriculture. And when the rain comes, it picks up all of the things that we don't necessarily want in our coastal environment, puts them into the sea, and that affects our seagrasses because they are a true plant. So just in the way that seagrasses are storing carbon in the sediments, they're also storing all of the nasty things as well. And it's probably worth mentioning they're also really, really good at storing nitrogen from runoff and from agricultural sources, as well as some of the nitrogen that we put out through sewage systems. So they're really good at cleaning. But I think it's a a lack of understanding of what takes place really close to these beds has an impact on them. That's one of the things that I think this collaborative project is trying to communicate is that we have an influence on our ocean and our ocean has an influence on us. And Vicky, given you know, you're know you an esteemed environmental manager and conservationist yourself, operating in probably the most beautiful harbour in the world, certainly one which is an incredibly dynamic environment, right? It's the third deepest natural harbour in the world. There's a ton of a variety of species from whales and cetaceans all the way down to those lovely little sea slugs in the marinas and stuff. We've got a very, very dynamic environment, but naturally as a harbour and as a port, there is the interaction of the environment with human activity. How have you seen in such a context, seagrass getting damaged by recreational activity in particular? Yeah, so it's a hard truth, isn't it? So we live in a lovely area and we all want to get out on the water and enjoy it. But some of the activities that we do have do have a physical impact on seagrass and other seabed habitats. So we've seen when people have anchored on the seagrass beds, visible seagrass fronds on the surface and in fact whole plants that have been sort of ripped up by the action of the anchor going through that bed. So as you can imagine, you know, it goes in and sort of disturbs the root structure of that seagrass. And also sort of, you know, localised moorings do do have a localised impact on the seagrass bed as well, because we use a granite block and a piece of heavy chain before the riser chain. And that heavy chain moves around with the wind and the tide and it produces a sort of scour patch because the heavy chain is sort of constantly moving and doesn't allow the seagrass to grow underneath it. So those physical impacts are there as well as the impacts that Mark mentioned as well with the poor water quality, etc. Seagrass needs to photosynthesise and when you get lots of particles in the water, it struggles to do so. We've got a bed particularly in Falmouth that is thought to be light limited and that's why it grows so tall and we're just learning so much more about this habitat and the impacts that we have are having on it and it's sort of you know been a fascinating journey to sort of learn about what we can hopefully do to help it as well. I think it's a really poignant image because Mark you started out by saying that you know we haven't necessarily known what's under the water and I appreciate that actively you know you'll always see people on the beach thinking oh it's dirty you know got to clean all the sand off and don't touch the seaweed and in some ways we're returning to that appreciation of nature in the round but there's a very poignant image where particularly when you're on a boat you don't necessarily engage with what's under the water at all because you're on a boat and we are as sailors for example incredibly appreciative of the water and passionate about it but we haven't had that visibility of what's underneath it other than what you might see on charts if you're interested or you need it obviously for safety or navigational purposes but there's some really incredible imagery which we'll share with this podcast of what you've explained Vicky is having sort of where a boat has been anchored or a mooring block has been laid and because of the rise and fall of the tide the chain will at some point be touching the bed so there are these huge I mean they're just almost perfect circles where the seagrass has been just scraped away effectively it really is quite something to see I want to switch to our project then and why it's been so important and why we started our project and how we went about letting boaters and water users sort of know where seagrass and sensitive beds are David, why should we and have we made this information about seabeds, locations, digital? 
Why bother? It's a great question. And I think um, going back to Matt's point from earlier on, I would fit squarely into the group of people that don't know what's on the bottom of the water. I've been boating for 30 years. I heard about seagrass for the first time probably two years ago, I'm ashamed to say. But it was through this project of working with Mark and Andy and OCT and New Holly and Clean Sailors and, and all the other great partners that we've got. Yeah, I didn't understand seagrass. It, it's like seaweed, I thought. It's the thing that you wade through that annoys you because you want that lovely sand between your toes. So I kind of think that if I'm a small representation of the boating community, I don't know what's happening when I anchor. I don't know what's at the bottom. If you look at a traditional chart, a paper chart, you'll see the seabed type. It'll tell you if it's rock, if it's mud, if it's sand, if it's silt, and it'll tell you where there are good places to anchor. And a great example is Stubland Bay. You know, there's a lot of activity there and around Plymouth Sound as well. You've got numerous anchorages. But on a paper chart, it didn't tell you anything else. The beauty of digital is we can update it really quickly. As we find out more about the environment, as we find out more about sensitive seabeds, we can update the chart virtually in real time, which with some of the, the seagrass beds around around England, we did really, really quickly. We got the data from Andy at OCT, and we got it into the app, and we got it in front of boaters probably within a couple of weeks of getting the data. So it can be that quick a turnaround. There's amazing data out there. There's lots of amazing scientists out there who collect a map. But if you're not telling boaters, if you're not telling the people using the water about it, you're only kind of solving, I would say, not even half of the problem. Because as quickly as you find something, it can get scoured, it can get wrecked, somebody can anchor on it, and it'll destroy all the good work, which takes years. You know, a seagrass bed doesn't pop up overnight, but it can be destroyed overnight. So telling people about it, letting them know where it is, and giving them the information to make a different and a better decision, I think, is key. We can't tell boaters what to do. It's not compulsory. There are voluntary no-anchor areas, but not compulsory ones. So we can't tell people what to do, but we can give them better options, I think. I really enjoyed your, and thank you for being so honest, your example of, you know, you've been boating around the world. So I appreciate you've got extensive experience in it. How has that now changed your perspective? Say you're out with your family, obviously using, say, Savvy Navi. Now you understand perhaps a bit more about the value of seagrasses. How does that change your perception of using your boat and anchoring in the water? It makes the decision making really easy and it's very convenient. I can see where the seagrass is. I can see that if I move... 100 yards further down the coastline, I can anchor, I can get the same view, I'm in the same bay, I can have exactly the same experience, but I'm not hurting the environment. So I can make a really easy decision. It doesn't affect me in any way, it doesn't affect my experience, but I don't have an impact on the environment negatively. And I think that's been sort of the tension, the natural tension. You're right, we don't need to tell people what to do. We're not a legislative body, project, organisation. It's important that obviously we inspire people and educate them. And that's what each of you in your respective roles is responsible for doing, particularly on a project like this. The really sort of pertinent point is, is that once we start to understand something better and the value of it, naturally we're then more akin to protect it and conserve it. So just by highlighting, hey, there's a really important global species under your boat right now. Do you want to drop your anchor here? (laughs) Question mark. It's almost like what's inferred by it. It's like, hey, you know, and appreciating, I want to be really clear here, under no means do we advocate in a safety situation not anchoring where is imperative to. The point is, as you said, David, is that seagrasses grow in the shallows and therefore are often the most beautiful places along a coastline, often very sheltered, often very beautiful. So helping to display where they are, I think, is obviously quite useful and important in that inspiration education process. I think the point is that the conservation community and the sailing community are not exclusive to each other. The point that David makes is that what this project allows is just people to understand and make their own choices. And many of the conversations that we've had with the boating community is they want to understand where habitats are. They want to lessen their impact. They want to. And I think David puts it really well that it just allows people to make decisions. And as you say, Holly, we're not telling people what to do. We're just giving them the information to make those choices. Boaters love the environment they're in. You know, we go out onto the water because we want to be in a beautiful environment. We tend to be more aware of what's going on around us. We have things like ants and fowl now and things like that fall off your boat and go over the side. And so I think people want this information and people will act on it because it's up close and personal to us. We can't see the seabed, but we know how important the ocean overall is. We know what an important job it does 
in so many ways and we want to be in a nice environment ourselves. So I think you're right, Matt, that the two are not mutually exclusive. They want to work together. And the more information we give voters, they will make better decisions. We will make better decisions. But I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And it's a bit like, you know, there's there have been other groups of water users, let's say, who perhaps more historically have been a lot more conservation minded, not least because they've been in the water surfing most of the time, swallowing it, getting sick by the water quality. So I think because naturally, while sailing is a very old sport, having that better connection and mindset with the water, I think is definitely increasing, let's say. And I think this project really obviously helps promulgate that. I want to chat also about the alternatives because I appreciate two parties, Mark and Vicky in particular, have come together a couple of times on AMS moorings and as an alternative to anchoring in in some of these sensitive seabed areas. Mark, what is an AMS mooring? An AMS mooring, so AMS stands for Advanced Mooring System. We sat down several years ago with the RYA and started discussing some of the concerns from the boating community about the terminology of eco moorings. They sounded more expensive and lesser quality to many people. So we collectively came up with the expression, the advanced mooring system. That means that in some circumstances, it is slightly more expensive but it's advanced in the sense that it is caring for the environment and lessening the impact, as uh, you say, Holly, with regards to some of the imagery that you're going to share. So there are numerous sort of options available on the market. I think from the US and Australia, they are a little bit more sophisticated in their uh, their approach to the use of AMS or advanced mooring systems, and certainly in some marinas and on the east coast of the states, I believe they're required legally. But the consideration that we have in the UK is that we have quite big tidal variances. And if we've got quite big tidal variances, for example, down in the southwest of the UK, then some of the solutions that have been offered from US markets or Australian markets are not suitable. There's been numerous mooring service providers that have worked with ourselves and Vicky Farmer Harbour to try and work out how best to provide a one solid engineering solution that people can feel confident and that doesn't do damage to the vessel and also provide a ecological consideration. So that's what an AMS is. And effectively, we're saying, just for complete clarity for some of our audience, instead of obviously anchoring necessarily, or even, a, say, a traditional mooring block, where we get those scour patches that Vicky talked about, particularly where you've got a tidal height, such as parts of the UK and Canada also, as Mark has pointed out, particularly for places that Vicky manages, such as the third deepest natural harbour in the world, you need a lot of chain. So that plus the tidal height means that you could potentially have a lot of excess chain dragging, obviously, around the seabed. And these AMSs are really designed to help almost that chain levitate in the water column so as to help prevent that scour on the seabed. So they can either be used as an alternative to a mooring or they could be put in place where people traditionally would anchor with the view that you're only impacting the seagrass bed as big as the sort of block that's holding the mooring to the seabed rather than the block plus a big circumference around it of chain scour. Vicky, you've tried this in Falmouth. How did it go? And ultimately, can seagrass regenerate? Yes, it can regenerate and our trial went well, but we still have questions around it. So in 2021, we removed 11 swing moorings because we started to understand the impact that they were having on a local seagrass bed to us in Flushing. So it was decided that we could remove those moorings, and we did. And we were very lucky to work with Sea Search Divers and University of Exeter to monitor the scour patches that were left behind. And over three years, they appear to have 
completely regenerated. So that's great. And we haven't done any active regeneration or anything like that. We've just removed that pressure, removed that impact and just watched the seagrass come back, which is brilliant to see. We've also marked that sort of small regeneration area with two advanced mooring systems, which has been in place since we removed the other moorings. And we've managed to see that they are also being really effective. Seagrass is growing right up to the block. So it's great to see that as well, that those are working. And we also trialled, we worked with a naval architecture company called Morec, and we trialled a advanced marine system suitable to hold a boat based on the design that Mark developed. And that worked and it held the boat in place for over four months in various weathers. We did it over summer and it did work, but we've still got remaining questions around sort of floats next to the surface and things like that, which we need to square away. But we're hoping to do a little bit more work on that this year to try and get more answers and, and work to try and you know move more of our moorings over to advanced mooring systems. That's really cool to understand that seagrass can regenerate. And it's a very positive story because I appreciate, you know, a lot of the narrative around seagrass beds and sensitive seabeds is that things are being lost and it's a slightly, you know, chaotic and somewhat dystopian world out there. And that's not to detract from the fact that, you know, it's an important issue and we are having an impact. But knowing if we can change our sort of methodology around how we use the seabed, particularly for recreational activity, it's really cool to hear that actually, dare I say, in as little as three years for such a common complex species in my view mark might tell me differently that it can regenerate and that actually that it can fill in its own gaps i appreciate we're not necessarily mm-hmm. going to be able to stop people from anchoring in seagrass all over the world mark what's your hope of boaters of water users and of the project in general around sort of inspiring educating on sort of sensitive seabeds my hope would be that i think as david said that people make decisions to just avoid that impact Seagrasses are in some ways quite resilient. They will recover. And I think Vicky's project in Falmouth has demonstrated that and some of the work that we've also done. They do need to have space to recover. We do need to provide space for nature. And certainly where there is a existing seagrass meadow, then over time that health can increase. And going back to some of the early studies that started our journey in seagrasses is if nature is provided the space to recover and it recovers well, then we see the return of those values, those ecosystem service values. And with multiple pressures from water quality to unsustainable sort of fishing practices to recreational impacts, if we can work together with all of the stakeholders and all of the people that are using and enjoying this space to provide options for them to continue to use this space, but in a less impactful way, then that provides the space that we need for these habitats to thrive and for our coastal environments to thrive and lots of our marine species. So that would be my hope, just provide space for nature. Provide space for nature. Well said, Mark. I think also it's a reminder that, you know, we've got a very beautiful relationship with nature, right? And it's not to say that we should engage less with it or spend less time in it because of the impact that we're having, but rather, you know, whether it is the advanced mooring system model or whether it's, you know, something that we haven't yet discovered or invented, there are better ways of doing things. We can make that relationship exist and if not expand, but as long as we're doing it within the parameters of ensuring that nature is somewhat protected. Vicky, same question to you. You're coming at it from a slightly different angle. What's your hope of boaters, water users around understanding and engaging with the natural environment, let's say? I think my hope is just, you know, if people understand and become more aware of where these sensitive habitats are and why they're so important, I would hope that they would make decisions based upon that, like David was explaining earlier. If they can anchor elsewhere, great, let's do that. If they can't, then there's also best practice that they can employ to reduce that impact and or you know pick up a mooring or, or whatever. But I think the more information you give people, then they become more aware and they can make positive decisions, which is great. And hopefully we'll get to a stage as a harbour where we're providing facilities that allow us to do what we love whilst not impacting on the environment or minimising it to a very small impact. It's an exciting and a tense space, isn't it? The human recreational activity, but also business and commercial activity alongside, 
you know, an incredibly beautiful natural environment. David, in terms of obviously the power of technology is unparalleled and actually being able to serve a user crudely, such as myself, information, accurate, up-to-date, timely information when I need it the most is incredibly potent. And we see that in a variety of different apps and tools that we all use on a daily basis. There's something obviously that sets the ability of savvy apart from perhaps our traditional mapping. And I've grown up with two generations of very traditional sailors, my grandfather and my father, who will always use paper charts alongside the dishwasher ones, just in case. And there's actually some sort of prudence in that. But there are integral limitations of using paper charting in that, you know, traditionally they do focus on safety and navigation only. And whilst that's incredibly important, we then miss the colour. You can't dive into the complexity of an environment on paper, on a two-dimensional, you know, asset. How have you found this journey with Savvy Navi in inspiring and educating voters? Like, how has that shaped your thinking as a team? And what are your hopes of the project going forward? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And, and I'm somewhat in the camp of your prior generation's grandfather and father, I think, Holly, in that I learned on paper charts. I learned to navigate traditionally and I made lots of mistakes. I forgot to add in leeway. I forgot to add in tidal drift when plotting routes. My maths was out. I didn't always get to where I wanted to be at the time I wanted to be there. And in the same way that I used to drive with a, an AA roadmap in the car without wanting to advertise AA roadmaps, nobody has them anymore. You use your phone, you take your phone out, you plug your phone into your car, and it tells you where there's a traffic jam. It tells you where there's a petrol station. It tells you where you can go to get snacks or fuel or anything. And the same, the same should apply to boating. And especially with new boaters coming in, because we all want to see more people enjoying the water. Now, we're not trying to limit water mm. users to protect seagrass. What we're trying to do is get more people onto the water, but in a responsible way. And new people coming into boating expect a digital solution because it's how they run the rest of their lives. So we kind of we need to serve people what they're looking for and what they want, and as you said, in a, in a timely fashion. So you can't zoom in on a paper chart. You can't click and interrogate the points of interest on a paper chart. But in a digital platform, you can. You can zoom right in and you can interrogate the points of interest. You can see exactly where Seagrass is. You can see where there's an advanced mooring uh, system, which we've added to the, the Savvy platform. So all of that goes to helping the boater make a better decision. But we can do it in a very fast and real-time way. If there's an error in the chart, um, traditionally with a paper chart, I would have to weekly go through any updates that came from UK UKXO and I'd have to annotate my paper charts all the time. And we know most boaters don't do that. We update the charts constantly. So either from UKHO or from data we get from you guys, from, from OCT and from Clean Sailors and from lots of other organizations, we can update them in, in virtually in real time to make sure boaters are fully aware of what's going on around them. And that's the direction of travel that people need and want digital to make fast decisions. and to stay safer because you can see when the weather's closing in, when the tide's changing, but also to make environmental decisions. I think information is incredibly powerful, isn't it? And you can pack so much into a digital experience, which is obviously why it was has been perfect for our project. Not least because as we know, you know, paper charts are wonderful. And I wanna be really clear, I do use them a lot. To your point, David, making a hell of a lot of mistakes along the way, which is also part of the learning curve. But you are limited. I mean, they're safety navigational assets only, right? And actually, you know, providing too much colour or information on that would just prove them inaccessible and unusable. So we have got a really unique opportunity to wrap so many dimensions of a very unique, dynamic environment into one place and ultimately provide information that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get elsewhere, such as sensitive seabed data. But David, what is your hope then for the industry, for boaters, for water users henceforth? My hope for water users is that they continue to get better information. And so one of the things that we work really closely with all of you guys on is finding accurate data sources to make sure data sources are validated and accurate and up to date. Because I think what we can't do is give boaters incorrect data because then they'll start ignoring it. So if we're suggesting boaters do something without a valid thought process and reason behind it, then you very quickly get to the point where they won't listen to what we're saying. So my hope is that more boaters are aware of what's around them 
and that we can serve them really super accurate data. I think they're the two things. It's almost marrying the two worlds, the kind of a science environmental, sustainable world with the boating world. I think Savvy is fairly well placed to help bridge those two worlds. If you're interested in learning more about our Protect Our Beds campaign, simply Google Protect Our Beds. And for more on the wonderful work being done by Vicky at Falmouth Harbour, head to falmouthharbour.co.uk. Mark Parry, David Cusler, Vicky Spooner, thank you very much for joining me this morning on such an important topic. You're welcome. It's great to see you all again. You've been listening to the Clean Sailors podcast. All relevant links to the projects and people we talk to can be found with the podcast link. For all episodes or to get in touch, just visit cleansailors.com. We love to hear from you. We believe that great ideas should be shared, which is why our podcast is free to appear on. So if you've got a project, idea or topic you think we should be discussing, get in touch. In the meantime, thank you for listening and see you for the next episode.